Here's to whiskey kisses, the peachy taste of sin. Greetings, whiskey folk, and welcome to another episode of Drinking Out Loud. I'm your host, Adam Bradshaw, and it is an absolute honor to have you back here once again on the official Drama Association YouTube channel here at the Strath Ale, Wine, and Spirit Merchants in Victoria, British Columbia. And this is an interesting one. Uh, we're doing a uh, something a little out of the ordinary here for Drinking Out Loud. We're pre-recording this episode several weeks in advance, which uh, is is going to cause a little bit of issues in terms of uh, me telling you that whiskies are available and uh, who knows, yeah, by the time this video airs, maybe they're not. Um, but it's for a very special reason, uh, a very special reason that I am absolutely floored and honored by. Um, and that reason is the impending new release of a very special local whiskey. Uh, and that very special local whiskey, well, it's, it's right here. Batch number five of the Glen Sarnich from Divine. Now, this already has a pretty big fan following. Um, a lot of people, um, not just in BC, but around around the world, I guess. I mean, at least look across Canada, um, have been following Divine's uh, spirits for quite some time now. And uh, yeah, they're one of many distilleries that are now in British Columbia. And it's, it's an interesting thing, craft distilling here in BC. Um, it apparently started in 2004 with Okanagan Spirits, and that's something I didn't realize until very recently when I read it in this fantastic new book. And uh, you'll be seeing this book a lot in today's tasting. Um, I will be borrowing from it, um, or well, just outright stealing from it at times. This is The Definitive Guide to Canadian Distilleries. And it is by a good friend of the Drama Association, Davin de Kurgamo, and uh, his writing partner, Blair Phillips. And this is an absolutely fantastic reference book for anyone interested in not just whiskey, but any spirit from across Canada. And uh, it's full of all kinds of fantastic um, information, most of it up to date. But the problem is, distillation here in Canada has been so rapid in its uh, expansion that uh, it's impossible to be up to date these days. Uh, this book, I believe it says uh, there are, as I say, 64 distilleries in BC. And I know that that is already out of date because it doesn't list um, one of the newest distilleries here on the island, Misguided Spirits, that is up in Parksville. Because, um, you know, the book was already published by the time that distillery um, uh, debuted earlier this year in 2020. Um, and I'm sure across the country there have been, well, many other distilleries that uh, at least were planning to open in 2020. Some of them might not have, unfortunately, because of the, you know, situation. Um, but there, yeah, there is a huge boom in craft distillation across the country right now. And uh, actually, I'll show you the little map that they have in there. It's a beautifully designed book, this, by the way. This wonderful map of all the distilleries across the province. Look at that. Isn't that great? Um, yeah, it's it's quite something. And they've split it up into three different regions of British Columbia. We've got the Vancouver region, um, the interior region, and of course, Vancouver Island here where we are, uh, which has a, just a stunningly large amount of distilleries for the, uh, for the size of it. I'm just counting now. I think there's 18 now distilleries on our island, which is frankly mad for the population we have here. Um, so yeah, it is an absolute honor um, that I have this bottle because I have the very first bottle to leave the distillery, uh, which is really cool. And the reason I have the very first bottle to leave the distillery of this, of this batch um, is because they've asked me to do tasting notes for it, which I'm very excited about. Um, I think this is the first time a company has asked me to do their official tasting notes. I've been doing tasting notes for um, a lot of releases um, for the store's usage and for my own personal you know, gratification, um, but I've never actually been asked by a distillery to provide my personal notes for them. So I, I, took, it, uh, I took it to heart, and I also knew that this would make an interesting video for, for the guys watching at home on YouTube. 
Um, it'll give you a bit of an insight about how I make my tasting notes. So you will set to see the beginning of my note-taking experience today. You'll get to see my first impressions as I open the bottle. You'll get to see some of the, the notes that jump forward to me. And then uh, later on, you'll be able to read my full tasting note review of this bottle, um, which will, you know, which, which will have some of the notes that uh, come out of my mouth on this video. Um, but I tend to, I tend to take tasting notes from multiple different time frames at the beginning of the bottle, the middle of the bottle, and hopefully towards the end of the bottle if I've got the time, um, and then sew them all together and create a little bit of a narrative of it. And that's something that I, I learned to do after, um, after doing Scotch Malt Whiskey Society tastings for um, a few years now and reading the panel notes that they've created. And I think one of the reasons that they do those uh, style of tasting notes that they do is it's incredibly difficult to actually create cohesive sounding notes from a panel. Um, it, it, it is. I mean, you've got, um, I don't know how many people normally in the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society panels, a dozen or so maybe, um, but they're all tasting different things as one should with a whiskey. It's, very, it's a very important thing to note with whiskey is that every single person that tastes it is going to taste something slightly different because that's, that's how it works. Uh, taste buds are individual and the complexity of especially malt whiskey is just vast. Um, so it just kind of ends up working that way. And yeah, I mean, in a sense, every single time that you will taste a whiskey, it will also be different for each individual. So even though I am going to be tasting this whiskey at least three times before I uh, do my full full write-up of notes. Um, it's going to be different every time. Uh, my palate is going to be um, in, a, in a different stage throughout the day. I mean, a lot of uh, whiskey uh, reviewers and a lot of whiskey blenders as well will only um, taste whiskey in the morning, and they believe that's actually when their palate is the most awake, I guess, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, so different times of the day, different food that you've had before or after, uh, different whiskies that you've had before or after will all come into play um, and will all affect the way you, uh, your tasting notes will come out. And today, it might not be morning anymore. I planned to be morning, but you know, a few things got in the way. Um, it is now the afternoon, but I haven't had any whiskey today. So this is going to be my first whiskey of the day, which means that I will have um, maybe a bit of a shock to the system, but my notes won't be impacted by anything I've had before in terms of whiskies. Uh, the next time I taste this whiskey, I will be trying it alongside other whiskies. I will be trying it uh, ha after having a whiskey um, beforehand. And I will also um, be trying it alongside a um, earlier release of this whiskey as well. So I can compare and contrast and look for similarities and maybe even narrow down what notes are, um, uh, are sort of more usual to find um, in the uh, series of releases of Glen Sarnish from Divine. And uh, yeah, that that's hopefully gives you an idea of how I go around making my tasting notes. And let's talk a little bit about Divine before I crack this one open. And let's talk about it through the, uh, through the lens of the Definitive Guide to Canadian Distilleries. So let's take a look. It's really easy to find the uh, distilleries on there because on that map page I showed you, it's got all the page numbers. So if you know vaguely whereabouts it is, it's a really easy way to look up where we're, uh, where we're going. So page 30 is what we're looking for for Divine. You can pick this book up, by the way, at all good online and in-person bookstores. I picked this one up uh, at the bookstore whose name I've temporarily forgotten. The one uh, in Victoria down on uh, Government Street there. It's old, it's fantastic, uh, the name is escaping me. Um, but you can pick it up at most good bookstores around uh, around the country, and you well, you, you should. Uh, you, to, be quite, to be quite frank, you, you really, really should. Uh, also, I can't apparently read because um, 30 is actually the number of the distillery, not the page. The page comes after, it's 52. So that's user error. That's uh, <laughs> in no way the book's fault. That is entirely my fault. And here we are. There we go. Divine Wines and Spirits, um, which on an interesting note, they've started off doing uh, mostly wines and then started doing spirits, and now they're doing mostly spirits. Um, so it's, it's an interesting development that uh, they've taken. Uh, okay, let's see what uh, Davin and his partner Blair have to say about Divine. 
When John and Catherine Windsor converted 10 hectares of overgrown Sarnich farmland into a vineyard in 2007, Ken Winchester helped them get the vines into the ground. Winchester is a micro-distilling legend. From across the street, he operated Winchester Cellars, a winery that became the first micro-distillery on Vancouver Island. Trailblazer. By 2015, Winchester was Divine's full-time winemaker. He returned to distilling when he learned of a vintage 25-year-old Coth still sitting unused in a barn. That's, that's a pretty cool origin story. His first spirit was Ban Gin, a London dry meat specific Northwest gin made from a base distillate of the winery's Brunner Veltlinger Pinot Gris and other island grapes. Winchester is also a historian of spirits and a passion for traditional distilling methods, on which he enthusiastically puts his own contemporary spin, a modern day Willy Wonka, without the hat and bow tie. Well, maybe if you ask him nicely, he'll wear it. Uh, in Ancient Grains, Winchester does something no one else is doing in Canada. He, still, he distills the ancestors of modern grains, spelt, anna, corisan, and einkorn, with malted barley, then ages the heritage grain spirit in new oak porter casks, a golden ticket to flavour. A Dutch-style yerva is made with 100% malted barley and 20 botanicals, grown on a farm nearby and a greenhouse in a large outdoor garden. Then there's Old Tom Gin, which he calls New Tom, plus two vermouths, a rum-like spirit, and Glen Sarnich a single malt whiskey. Winchester has also revived slow gin thanks to a local farmer who showed up one day with a branch of berries, asking if he had any use for them. Winchester recognised them as slow berries. Not interested in making a traditional slow gin liqueur, he soaked the berries in van gin, transforming both the colour and the flavour. So, as you can tell from this wonderful write-up, Divine don't just make whiskey, they make all kinds of different spirits. But I know for a fact they're very, very passionate about whiskey, and this is one of their flagship products. This is one of the things they're most proud of, and it's won awards at the Canadian Whiskey Awards. Many of their whiskeys have won awards, including, actually, a gold medal for our very own Strath-exclusive single cask of that ancient grains that you just heard mentioned in the book, um, which we still have some on the shelf, by the way. So if you haven't picked up a single cask caster in the ancient grains yet, what are you waiting for? And... To be fair, what am I waiting for? It's about time I opened this very special whiskey. All right. This is where I check to make sure on the screen that it's actually recording, because I can only open this whiskey for the first time once. Yeah, okay, we're going. <laughs> All right. So I do have a little bit of information about this release, and this is a release that I have very, very much been looking forward to ever since I first um, visited Divine and got the tour of their warehouse and saw the spirit resting in casks that would then become this release. Ooh. So you can only open it once, maybe I can't open it at all. I might need to... Uh... <laughs> I need to sharpen my nails. The, uh, the plastic bit came off, but then the rest of it's stuck there. I've said it a few times now. I could probably make a montage of all of my struggling to get bottles open. I'm not very good at this, despite having done it hundreds of times. Just... All right, let's see. I'm, I'm a little bit further in. All right, I'm gonna have to make a cut and uh, go and get some scissors. All right, I'm in. Whew, okay. Here we go. Bam. Fantastic. Looking forward to this. So, I mentioned seeing the casks of whiskey, and they stood out quite uh, quite well in the in their um, maturation warehouse, which is also their still house. They're a very small place uh, when I visited, because whilst almost everything in the warehouse was uh, what they're calling the quarter size, which I think is really an octave size, it's a quarter of a barrel, so it's very, very small. That's what they've been maturing almost all of their uh, whiskey in so far, including our, uh, our cast strength uh, single cask um, ancient grains. Um, and up to date, I believe pretty much all of their um, Glen Sarnich as well. Um, but they had some full size barrels maturing, and that was their first step into upping production and having a much larger release for their Glen Sarnage whiskey. And that's exactly what we have right here. This is 100% uh, full ex-bourbon sized barrels. And they're actually first filled ex-bourbon barrels as well. And in true uh, sort of 
Ken Winchester developed divine style. They're merging the traditional with the avant-garde once again. And uh, they've actually got four casks, some of them from uh, a very traditional bourbon uh, distillery in Kentucky. You might have heard of them. It's a little place called Woodford Reserve. You know, for those of you who are in the know, you probably know Woodford Reserve. And another one, which uh, to the best of my knowledge hasn't been available in DC, or at least I haven't seen it, um, a much more uh, local distillery, um, <laughs> funnily enough, Woodenville, who are in Washington State. And funnily enough, they also use a very similar type of still to this still that Divine use. This is made uh, in a coast still, um, a German style um, pot still, which they actually have given the nickname a Brunhilde, which sounds fantastic. I, I, I love naming stills. I mean, I, I like naming things in general, but naming stills, I think, it just gives them a personality that uh, then helps to shine through in the whiskey. I don't know if it doesn't actually, but it's cool. So one thing the uh, book doesn't mention about Ken Winchester is the fact that he actually was, for a time, at Brookladdy in Scotland. That's how he got into uh, distillation. Um, uh, he was, uh, yeah, he was an apprentice, I believe, of Brookladdy. And that obviously rubbed off on him. The, the, the progressive Hebridean distillers, as they like to call themselves, take pride in uh, using local barley when they, whenever they can. And that is something that Divine, you know, do. They, uh, I mean, as with their ancient grains, as it mentioned in the book, they grow their own. Um, but all of the barley that has been used in this whiskey was grown on the Sarnich Peninsula here in Greater Victoria, which is really cool. Uh, it's a true local craft product in every sense of the word. Even the malting process was done at Phillips, you know, the brewery, right? And also malting house, and also now distillery, actually, right here, right in the, here in downtown Victoria, like a five minute walk or so from where I am. Well, 10 minutes, maybe 15, um, but still very, very close. It's all done right here. It's grown here, it's malted here. And then from that point on, every single step of the process is done at the distillery. They, uh, they mill their own grist, they make their own wash and they distill it. Two times, twice distilled, two times, I can't pronounce the word two, um, two times, uh, twice distilled in the Brunhilde uh, pot still, which is mighty cool. All right. I was going to, I was going to say I should probably uh, read the bottle, but I think I pretty much said everything that's on the bottle. But let's do it anyway. Authentically grain to glass. Vancouver Island grown and malted barley, mashed and fermented on site, and twice distilled in our vintage copper pot still Brunhilde. We age our new make spirit in once a used bourbon barrels. And it's interesting that they say once used rather than the traditional Scottish uh, verbiage of first fill. Uh, I mean, I guess that's slightly more confusing because first fill makes it sound like it's a virgin cask, but it's actually first fill ex bourbon. It's the first time it's had something other than bourbon in it. Um, so I'm going to call it first fill like bourbon because that's the uh, the lexicon that I grew up with. Uh, but once used bourbon, as it says on the uh, on the on the bottle here, in the tradition of the finest Scotch whiskies. And then it has a I just noticed it goes into their own tasting notes, which I'm going to do my best to ignore. I saw the word citrus, and hopefully that won't impact me too much. Um, but yeah, here we go. Got the lid off. I'm dribble getting back in again now. There we go. It's these prototypes. <laughs> okay, well, straight on the nose, I can smell that it is thankfully not 40%. I forgot to look at the ABV, but it smells like it's got some heft behind it. So this is, yes, 45. That's good news. It's got a little bit of that more nose tingly um, vapor going on, which is perfect for me. The first thing I found on the nose, however, is gooseberry, um, which is kind of interesting. It's a little sharper, a little tarter than I remember the previous versions uh, being. And I'm looking forward to going back and doing a side by side. Maybe I'll film that as well. I think uh, I probably should. Yeah, 
So now it's opened up a little bit. Those initial um, sort of harsher vapors have, have come off of it and fled the glass. The, uh, the gooseberry is calming down into a little bit more of a creaminess now. It's, it's morphed from um, a more sharp, acidic kind of a nose to a more of a, almost like a Greek yogurt kind of a thing now. Gotta say though, gooseberry Greek yogurt is a good way to, uh, good way to start off a, a nosing. Or a day, it sounds like a fantastic breakfast. Very refreshing. Something that would go very well with grapefruit juice, I see. Yeah. And yeah, there is a little bit of citrus in there. And I know it feels like cheating because I read it on the bottle, but there is definitely something, maybe not grapefruit, but more towards that more, actually just generic citrus. Actually, it reminds me an awful lot of uh, something I had a couple of weeks ago uh, by the time this as and about three days ago in real time, um, the yuzu wine that we had at the Japanese drinks tasting with Pat Dunlop. It's got a little bit of that sort of most lemonadey mixed citrus. It's got lime, orange, and yes, a touch of grapefruit in there. But yuzu maybe is the is is the citrus that it really is coming across more. There's a bit of spice. I think the most prominent one on the nose right now is probably cinnamon. Little nutmeg. Little pepper. Hmm. All right. Let's see what I find on the palate. Hmm. Oh yeah. Oh, what is that? That is a nut. That is, that is a nut of some kind. Or is it? I think it's peanut butter. I think that's the first thing I get on the palate there, is a nice, friendly peanut butter sandwich on a, on a multi-grain bagel. Is it really a sandwich if it's on a bagel? I guess if you put, you know, put it in half and put half on each side, it's a bagel sandwich. But yeah, peanut butter on a multi-grain bagel. Mm. Mm, with a vanilla latte. It's mm, maybe not a latte, maybe a vanilla London fog. It's not as bitter as a coffee, but it does have a bit of a tannic thing in there. I think it's more, yeah, it's, it's that little citrus in there. It's, it's an Earl Grey creamy vanilla thing. I think it's a, a, a London fog with vanilla syrup. Mm. All over the breakfast, Matt. And, but not your typical breakfast. It doesn't taste like cornflakes. It's uh, it's a very hipster breakfast. Maybe that would be the uh, the tasting the tasting nickname I end up with this one, a hipster breakfast. Maybe not. Um, I'm sure I can do something a, a little bit more poetic for it. But that's the kind of flavors that I'm getting right off the bat. Hmm. interesting there there is a touch of like a caramel flavor in there but without it's not the sweet caramel it's this it's not a particularly sweet whiskey actually straight off the bat it's it's not overly sweet it's not overly bitter it's not overly sour it's a very well balanced whiskey in terms of the traditional flavor profiles there's a touch of umami in there it's a little bit a um, little bit savory a little bit salty Hmm. Yeah, it's very scented. It's very zen. Hmm. It's, uh, yeah. Very, very good, actually. I have to admit. The, uh, the last divine that I tasted was uh, last year's release when they had their first one that they could legally call a whiskey, the first one that was at least three years old, which of course this is also a whiskey. It's, uh, it's not a whiskey spirit, it is a full-on whiskey. We don't know the exact age, but we do know it's at least three. And uh, yeah, this is, this is glorious. I'm really enjoying this. And I'm not just saying that because it was a free bottle and I like the guys. Like, objectively, this is a good whiskey. And 
sometimes I do have to be brutally honest with these uh, whiskey tastings, and I try to be um, honest when I can. I try to give constructive criticism, especially to the local guys, because, I, you know, what's, what's, what's the old phrase? A high tide raises all ships. Um, I, I want everyone to be as good as they can be, and if, if, uh, if my opinion can help um, their improvement, then that would be great. And, um, of course, my opinion is just one person's opinion, and um, it'll probably get lost in the crowd. But if my voice is one of many selling a distillery to do something slightly different, then maybe they will listen. Um, but they'll not listen if people don't speak out. So that's that's a word of advice for any any whiskey fans out there. Um, of course, be polite, be courteous, be uh, respectful. But do give negative feedback to people if they uh, if they need it. Um, you know, be cautious of the way you go around it. But if there's a distillery that you know and love, and you know you you want to support, a good way of supporting them is to, you know, help them know honest feedback on their products. Mm. I'm trying to think of some kind of constructive criticism to give this, and the only one I can think of is it'd be really nice to see what it was, what it'd be like with a little bit more age on it, but I think they already know that. I, th I know they already know that because they've got more whiskey maturing. Um, this is, yes, a full, exciting new release, but you've got to remember, these guys are still a young distillery. They've only been around for four or five years. So this is, whilst exciting and delicious, still a sneak preview of their full, true potential, which is uh, it's going to be a, a, a joy to uh, to discover with them. And uh, hopefully I stick around in the Victoria area long enough to, uh, to to go on that journey alongside them. But there is, yeah, no, I mean, there is absolutely nothing wrong with this whiskey in terms of uh, this rough edges or off notes or anything like that. It's um, astoundingly good. It's also astoundingly good for me as a bit of a whiskey purist. I was very disappointed when I first went to Divine and saw the still that they had because I've always thought that um, good whiskey had to come from a really big traditional, you know, Forsyth style copper pot still. I, I didn't think that a weird little, you know, what I would, what I often refer to as a Holstein style still or a German still, a bare coast still. I never thought that those kind of stills could make really good whiskey, but I was an idiot. <laughs> as has been proved by these guys, as has been proved by uh, other, other distilleries like Koval, who use exactly this kind of uh, still uh, down in the States, in Illinois, or of course in, in the uh, Woodenville, who uh, I've never tried their whiskey, but by all accounts is very, very good. Um, and other, I've got to say, and other distilleries all around Canada who have used this kind of uh, still to create really good whiskey in smaller volumes. And I'm really glad that they have, because it turns out it's really, really quite good sometimes. Um, I should mention, there is one more thing on this bottle, which is very exciting, that I haven't mentioned until now. So you hear the word Ken, the words Ken Winchester brought up all the time with Divine. He was, he was the guy that really, you know, made them start distilling, put them on the map, really um, helped build their profile. But there's another distiller at Divine, uh, a person who you can tell how uh, how dedicated he is to whiskey by his not only his approach to making whiskey, but his approach to being part of the whiskey community and his approach to learning about whiskey as well. And his initials are on this bottle. I believe for the first time, you don't see a KW, you, say, you see a KT. So this is Kevin, Kevin Titcomb who has done an absolutely wondrous job at, uh, at taking some of the reins, at least, from, uh, from Ken, and um, really being a fantastic distiller and also ambassador for Divine Distillery. Um, so an, a huge thank you to, uh, to Kevin for all of the hard work and dedication that he's put into making spirits, not just this spirit, but spirits across the board at Divine. And of course, a thank you to Ken, for teaching Kevin possibly not everything you know, because I know uh, 
Um, it's, it's never a good idea to reveal all of your cards, but uh, for teaching Kevin enough of what you know to be able to produce these wonderful spirits going forward as well. Hmm. So yeah, that's my first set of notes going into this one. And uh, yeah, congratulations guys, I think you're onto a winner. I'm not entirely sure when this is being released. Um, there was a couple of dates being uh, being thought about, but uh, this video will air just before it gets released. And I can tell you that we are going to have it in stock. Um, it's it's a much bigger release than normal. You will be able to get it, of course, direct from the distillery. You can get it um, at many fine independent liquor stores across the province, but the Strath will be one of them. Um, this is pending, but should be at least approximately correct. The price that I've got penciled in right now is $92.96, $92.96. And that is eligible for a 10% discount for a week after this uh, video has been aired. And you can get it then for $83.66 within that first week of this video um, being, being online. Um, I will be putting it up a couple of days before it actually releases so that people can pre-purchase if they wish. So as soon as this video goes live, the uh, the option to get your bottle of uh, the new, fantastic, full-scale, full-size edition, uh, but still quite small batch, but the full-size edition of the Divine's Glen Sarnage. Um, head over to strathliquor.com right now, search Glen Sarnage in the little search bar at the top and you'll be able to find it easily. Yeah, I hope this goes down well. And on that note, if you are watching this video a little bit later and you're wondering, oh, I, I, I wish I had a time machine. I would, I would have loved to have got 10% off this bottle. Well, so long as it's still available, which, you know, it might not be. But if it is still in stock, you can still get 10% off by, of course, signing up to being a premium, premium, premium member of the Dram Association. It costs $10 a month to subscribe and you get 10% off all um, whiskies that are not Scotch Malt Whiskey Society and are not already on sale. So the vast, vast majority of whiskies you are eligible to get 10% off, as well as getting first dibs on some beautiful exclusives here at the Strath and some fantastic exclusive pricing only available to premium uh, members. Okay, I'm not ending the tasting here, however, because we actually have quite a few fantastic distilleries in the area who are releasing whiskies or have just released whiskies or I just happen to have just bought a bottle. So I've got three more bottles right here, which I've never opened before, that I'm going to open up and try for the first time here, right live on YouTube, not well, live, but recording and on YouTube, unedited, apart from maybe taking out a couple of minutes of me trying to open a bottle. <laughs> um, and it's with great pleasure that we move on to the mainland now to another distillery, which you can tell are very, very into the whiskey scene and not just making whiskey because they have the equipment. And that is a distillery called Odd Society, a distillery who are showing up at festivals all over the country, um, or at least all over the province. Uh, I ran into them up at um, the Courtney Comox Festival earlier this year before the shutdowns. Um, I can't remember if they were at Nanaimo, they might have been. Um, I was there purely as a customer for Nanaimo, so yeah, I don't remember too much of that evening. <laughs> I remember having a ridiculously old, old company and everything else is a bit of a blur, to be honest. Um, but yeah, Odd Society. Let's give their brand new release a try. This is adorable. So this is an also, also an interesting thing because this uh, bottle was actually given to me by the company who is representing them now. Uh, it was dropped off in the store for me and uh, I haven't tried it and you're about to see on video me make a decision as to whether I should bring it into the store or not. So. That feels fraught with danger, and I really hope for their sake that this whiskey is good and I get to say a resounding yes, but let's find out. Um, but first, let's take a look at their uh, page in the Definitive Guide to Canadian Distilleries. All right, so let's go to the big map. We're looking for Odd Society in Vancouver. It is on page 32. Come here. Alrighty. 
Beautiful. Our Society Spirits, Vancouver, BC. Uh, Gordon Glantz graduated from Harriet Watt University with a master's degree in brewing and distilling. Funnily enough, I also went to Harriet Watt University. It's the place to be. I did mathematics though, and uh, I regret that. Not long after that, he and some friends were discussing the idea of starting a distillery, a, con a conversation he recalls exactly. We'll be like a club, a society, someone declared excitedly. But what kind of society, someone else asked. An odd society. And so when the time came, they named their new enterprise Odd Society Spirits. Glanz and his wife, Miriam Karp, who manages the distillery, are no oddballs when it comes to crafting fine spirits. Though he loves to stretch the bounds of distilling by experimenting with methods and ingredients, his operation is based in sound science. Along with a used 500 litre Holstein still and a 15 plate palm still, they have added a column to the top of their mash tun, so the tun can double duty as a wash still. Well, that is genius, I have to say. I didn't know you could do that, and I'm surprised that more people haven't. Maybe they didn't know that either. Maybe these guys are the first to do it. That's brilliant. Uh, more recently, they installed a new 1000 meter Holstein still to complement the original. They also collaborate with local brewers, trading barrels back and forth, which is something they wanted to explore from the beginning. Situated in Vancouver's commercial port area, the Odd Society name has helped shape the ethos of the ex-motorcycle garage turned distillery. Local tattoo artist Schwa Kirstid, recruited to paint a centerpiece over the bar, portrayed the stills as a, that's a word, a phantasmagor, phantasmagoric, no, phantasmagorical, phantasmagorical, um, mashing of beasts and spirits that define the unworldly character of this odd society. Nonetheless, the spirits themselves, though heavenly, are much more of this world. Enjoy them at the bar, accompanied by appetizers, or at home, served straight or in a cocktail. All right. Thank you, Davin and Blair, for that uh, write-up. It is distilled with 100% BC, BC grown malted barley. That is, uh, that is very nice. It's 46% ABV. This is batch four. What did I say the uh, Glen Sarnage batch was up to? Batch five, so we're a batch behind. Uh, this is batch four, which is very cool. Um, 2020 is written there, actually handwritten, as is the number four. That must take a while. Uh, let's see what it says in the back. A new legacy. Commodore honours tradition, beckoning to a Scottish heritage, whilst proudly thriving in its west coast birth. Commodore is distilled from 100% BC grown malted barley, to which it owes its distinctive almond sweetness, along with its pepper and tobacco notes. Refined and confident, this Canadian single malt proudly declares, welcome to the new world. So we have had some Commodore before, and we've had the 500ml bottles, and I don't know what batch it was. I unfortunately didn't manage to pick one up. They were quite popular. I think we actually had them just before the uh, uh, the Victoria Whiskey Festival, maybe two years ago, maybe 2019. Um, and you know, they, they went because we had a lot of people in town who weren't from BC, and were like, ooh, I'm going to buy a BC whiskey. I'm going to buy this one because it looks cool. And they're probably quite happy with it. But I have yet to try this batch at the very least. So let's give it a crack. Hmm. So it's gonna be very hard for me not to directly compare this to the Glen Sarnich, to be honest because, you know, that's my frame of reference for the day. First off the bat, it's a little bit more spirity. It's a little bit more youthful and vigorous smelling than the Glen Sarnage. And uh, the first thing that comes across is marmalade. Yeah, definitely marmalade for me. That's an interesting one. Hmm. Definitely smells a little sweeter. See, almond, um, and whereas I, I can see where they're coming from, uh, for me it's a very specific almond flavour, it's definitely marzipan. Hmm. You know how some whiskies taste like a Christmas cake? This tastes like what you put on top of a Christmas cake. Hmm. Or smells rather. Mmm. A little biscuity. A little, a touch short on the finish for uh, for my palate. Um, although then again, that might change day to day, of course. Um, 
little tobacco-y, which is nice. I, I like the, the slightly deeper flavour infused into there as well. It definitely tastes more what I would associate with craft small batch um, whiskey. And I'm not I'm not saying that in any kind of disparaging way at all, but it, it doesn't taste traditional. It doesn't taste like scotch at all. It doesn't taste like what I've grown up to believe single malts, quote unquote, should taste like. But as a spirit and for its own merit and not trying to harken back to a, a potentially dated preconceived notion, this is good spirit. It's very nice. I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's an excellent whiskey, but it is an excellent spirit um, for what it's worth in that sense. And yeah, I mean, it's unique. Definitely gets points for me on the on the uniqueness. Uh, for those of you who have seen some of my three minutes uh, thought videos, which I should definitely do more of, and I keep I keep putting off. I keep telling myself today I'm going to record some three minute thought videos, and then I get distracted by something shiny or get incredibly busy. <laughs> um, but I will do some more three minute thought videos. Uh, but you'll know that when I am deciding whether I'm going to bring something into uh, the strat. I give it a ranking out of 15, and anything that is 10 or over is like what I would very heavily consider bringing in. Um, so I give it 5 for uniqueness, and uh, out of 5 of uniqueness, and I would definitely give this a good 4.5 for unique, I've got to say. It's, it's definitely not like any other BC spirits, Canadian spirits that we have on the shelf right now, with maybe... Hmm, Maybe the exception would be Lowy McKinnon. I think that would be the closest. Um, but yeah, I mean, it definitely gets a good score for uniqueness. Um, it gets a good score for the uh, the story because they're local, and that is always going to bump up the score a couple of points for me. So uh, I, I say I'd say probably say four for that. So they're already at eight and a half. So so long as I think the quality is above one and a half, then that means theoretically I should bring them in. I guess, doesn't it? Do I think the quality is above one and a half? Yeah. Yeah, I certainly, certainly do. So I guess by my own metric, that means I should be bringing some in. Um, so I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna take a look at the piece of paper behind the camera to figure out, because uh, I, I did the math to find out how much it would be if I brought it in. And I've decided if I'm going to bring it in, I'm not going to bring in the half size like this guy. I'm going to bring in the full size bottles this time. Um, and apparently, and this might change depending if my math is uh, is rubbish, but according to my rough scribblings, I should apparently be putting this on the shelf for seventy three eighty three, which means with a ten percent off, um, if it's available um, at the time of uh, airing for this video, means you can get it for sixty six forty five, which is actually really really good. Um, Actually, the the value aspect of it definitely gives it an extra point as well. So yeah, I mean, I will be bringing this in. So um, yeah, thank you to uh, Art Society for sending me this uh, sample bottle. I will I will now share it amongst the whiskey community as uh, as as I think is proper and right. I won't hoard it away like smell for myself. I will make sure that it gets passed around and uh, a lot of people get to sample it. And uh, yeah. Welcome to the shelves at the Strat. So long as you have some in stock when I place my order later today, we will be getting you in. Fingers crossed. Hmm. So we've got two more whiskies that uh, I'm going to be looking at today. And uh, definitely distilleries that I'm very, very familiar with. Um, so we're looking next at Shelter Point. You know I'm familiar with Shelter Point because I did an entire video about Shelter Point where I went through um, all, I, I don't know how many I had, 11 maybe at the time, um, Shelter Point bottlings. I've since picked up another four, I think. So I have just a stupidly large amount of Shelter Points in my collection at home now. Um, but this one was actually gifted to me, not by the distillery, but by a, uh, a friend of mine who, uh, um, after, um, after, Tasting many, many of my whiskies uh, over the last few years has decided that it's about time they um, uh, chipped in some whiskey of their own for my collection, and I'm truly grateful for that. That is not expected from anyone I share my whiskies with. Um, I, I share my whiskies 
to be to enjoy the sharing of whiskey, not because I expect anything back. Um, but thank you very much um, uh, to the kind donator of this. I'm not going to embarrass you by saying your name, but you know who you are if you're watching. Um, I'm looking forward to trying this because I was going to pick one of these up for myself anyway. So uh, it's truly um, a perfect gift, <laughs> something I was going to get anyway that I now no longer have to spend the money on. Um, and this is something they picked up direct from the distillery um, as well when they were up there. Because this is a distillery that you can visit um, quite easily. They have tours, and if you haven't been up there, you absolutely should. Whether you're in Victoria, or whether you're across the country, or whether you're across the world, uh, you should make it part of your whiskey journey to one day come and visit Shelter Point. It is a beautiful, beautiful place to discover. And uh, let's see what Davin and Blair have to say about Shelter Point. I'm intrigued to see their write-up. I haven't read any of these in advance. I, truth be told, um, I went and got this book specifically before this tasting because I knew it would come in very useful and I also wanted to help them promote it a little bit. I honestly feel very guilty that it's taken me a couple of months to pick it up. I should have got it right away. Um, and to be honest, I tried, but the local bookstore didn't have it in when I went and I just haven't been to a bookstore since because I haven't been many places since. But let's take a look at Shelter Point. All right, Shelter Point is on page 52. 52. All right. Nope. Divine's on page 52. Can I just not read again? I think I need to get my eyes tested. That's another thing I've been putting off. Sixty-two. Yeah, all right. Definitely needs to get my eyes tested. Let's try that again. Alrighty. Oh, and there's a beautiful picture of two people I know very well. There's Jake and Leon, I believe, on top of a mountain. Um, yeah, this will be one of the uh, helicopter trips. I think they probably took Davin on one of their helicopter trips. Good on them. So, Shelter Point Distillery, with its 155 hectares of farmland and two kilometers of Salish Sea beach, couldn't be more beautiful. I agree. There, third generation dairy farmer and distiller Patrick Evans grows barley. If barley grows well here, he thought, why not make whiskey? The first few batches were not encouraging. Today, though, the team, including head distiller Leon Webb, operations manager James Marinus, and distillery manager Jacob Weave, successfully make vodka, gin, and single malt whiskey that is a genuine Canadian sensation. The gin uses juniper and other botanicals that Evans cultivates right on the farm. From a ton of grain, the team distills Shelter Point gin, 1,200 bottles at a time, in their new specific mechanical pot still, another wonderfully briny gin which they flavour with sea asparagus from their own seashore, makes a vaguely dirty martini without the nuisance of olive juice. Although Shelter Point is best known for its single malt whiskey, Evans has not forgotten his Irish ancestry. He fills a few barrels with Irish pure pot still style spirit made with a 50-50 malted and unmalted barley. Late in 2018, a new triumph emerged from the warehouse behind the distillery, 100% rye whiskey that Webb believes is the best he's ever tasted. And actually, I should mention that, there's been a lot of talk, good and bad right now, about uh, about the uh, the um, Alberta Premium cast strength and power to uh, to to the guys at uh, Beam Centauri for um, I don't know by the time this airs maybe more will come of it but at the time of recording they have uh, said they are considering just um, cutting all ties with uh, the Whiskey Bible. I feel dirty even saying Whiskey Bible, <laughs> um, but. Uh, yeah, if that's the best um, the, the best whiskey in the world, then Shelter Point have accidentally um, accidentally created an even better whiskey because they actually had the best rye whiskey in Canada at this year's Canadian Whiskey Awards, which is also a cast strength, maybe possibly Alberta Premium, um, that they uh, bought in uh, when they first started to use for their blending. And then he later realized the quality that they had and uh, thought, well, maybe we should have released it. And it turns out they did. And it was the best whiskey in Canada. And I think better than the quote unquote best whiskey in the world of one man's opinion. And one man's opinion, which I am very tired of hearing of by now. Anyway, back to the book. Um, if you ever get tired of gazing across the Salish Sea, turn around to see some of the highest mountains on the island, including Mount Washington, a famous training ground for Olympic snow sports. Very nice. So, thank you very much.
very much Davin and Blair for the bit of a write up there. As I said, I'm very familiar with Shelter Point. I've been there many, many times. I'm friends with the guys there, um, especially Jake and Leon. And uh, I actually tried this whiskey before it was bottled. I tried, well, I tried the prototype of it um, when I was when I snuck into the back area with Leon a few months ago when I visited. And uh, it was very good then. And I'm sure it's going to be very good now. This is a batch two of their Smoke Point whiskey, a whiskey which um, I, I very much enjoy, and a whiskey which I'm proud to say we have our own strap version of, in a sense, in the Echoes of a Hebrides single cask release that we did, which was a, uh, a purely single malt version of their Smoke Point. And what makes Smoke Point Smoke Point um, is the finishing time in a ex Laphroaig quarter cask, or I think there's a marketer, just an ex Isla quarter cask. Let's see what it says on the bottle. Smoky sky and peated whiskey. Also, funny that the week that this actually arrived in the store, um, there was literally smoky skies. Um, you can check out my Instagram or the Drama Association Instagram, rather, for a great shot of that. Um, batch two of Shelter Point's only peat influenced whiskey. This single grain smoky delight has been aged in American oak ex bourbon casks for five years and then finished in casks previously used by an Isla distillery for 18 months. This whiskey is a union of malted and unmalted barley spirit commingled in an American oak cask for five years. Subtle peat notes are from the ex Isla cask. Sweet, smoky, and complex. This one needs to be savoured by open fire. I'm looking around to see if there's anything I can set fire to. Not safely, unfortunately. Um, I think in general it's a good idea not to start a fire in a hotel room, so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll not do that. But yeah, this is a really, really cool release. Um, peaty flavoured, not peated barley, entirely from the cask. Uh, something that a few Scotch distilleries have done in the past, um, I know, um, I think the first one I've tried, possibly the first one um, to do it, uh, was the Scapper. Um, I know that Ardmore did also do a peated cask, but it's hard to tell because they're also peated. So, you know, I'm not entirely sure um, how much of that was necessary. Um, that being said, I've had the Ardmore single, we've got a single cask Ardmore uh, sold out now from, uh, I think it was a Morrison Mackay release that was um, also um, ex Lebroy finish, which is kind of cool. But I know, um, yeah, it was definitely a thing that Scapper really put on the, on the map with their re relaunch. Um, the Glancer, I think it's called. And it's something that's been done all over the world. I mean, Shelter Point, yeah, they're the first people around here to do it, and it's, it's really cool that they did that. But it's not a completely new idea. It's a little bit tried and tested, but it's new for us here in BC, and that's kind of kind of matters. Um, it's it's still still new for here. A bit Cavalan did it too. Very nice. Cavalan PT Cask, they called it. Smoke Point's a better name. I don't know who came up with that, but good work. Uh, Echoes of the Hebrides, which, as I mentioned, is kind of our single cask smoke point in a sense, is 100% single malt. This is a single grain because it's a mixture of malted barley and unmalted barley. The old unmalted portion, of course, from their farm. Mm. And those of you who know me uh, well, We'll, we'll know that one of my favorite styles of whiskey is likely peated whiskey. I love it when peat is there, but and I've used this I've used this hundreds of times, so sorry if I feel like I'm repeating myself. Um, but I like it when peat is an instrument in an orchestra and not a solo instrument. Hmm. I'm not going to overanalyze this one at all because I already have it on the shelf and I already believe in it as a product. and. You know, it's actually already really hard to find because they sold out at the distillery. Uh, we still have some bottles left at time of recording. Uh, I'm sure we still do by time of um, by time of release as well because we've stocked up. I definitely recommend you getting this. Mm. But this is um, this is glorious. It's so much peatier than the Smoke Point one, and that's almost entirely, I'm sure, because of the double, <laughs> I think, um, maturation time in the Isla casks. Also, if you look back far enough on their uh, social media feeds, you'll be able to see a great video of them receiving the extra Freud quarter casks and rolling them out of the truck. It's very, very entertaining. I, I kept wanting to do it at like a one and a half speed and put like the, uh, was it the Benny Hill or something music in the background? Oh, 
Ah, oh. glorious. One of the unique things about using the um, the casks to impart the peat in this way rather than the barley is you still get to taste the underlying whiskey and all of the complexities that come from distilling with a malted barley with that bit of peat as well. It's almost like a blend in a sense. It reminds me very much of um, some of my favourite um, blends to come out of Scotland in recent years that are marriages of, mal of uh, peated and unpeated whisky. Things like the, um, uh, what's it called, the, the, uh, the, the Shetland Reel. Things like the Shetland Reel or maybe the Lumreek or some of the things that Compass Box are putting out as well where they have a nice marriage of peaty and unpeated. Or make a grouse, of course, as well. Mm. But yeah, they're doing a, a fantastic job with this style of whiskey. Um, you do get that little hit of um, medicinal peat that you usually find with Laphroaig, um, that is trans transposed across to this whiskey. Um, I'm getting um, kind of a dusty peach <laughs> as well. A dirty peach. A peach rolled in ash. Yeah, it's, it's a surprisingly fresh and vibrant take on peated whiskey. Which is one of the reasons I enjoy this so much. Um, it's just as good as I remember the Frog's type being when I had it at the distillery. It's, I would say, better than the Smoke Point one. And it is a very welcome addition to the to the local whiskey scene here. To, to the plethora of uh, local... Uh, BC whiskies that we now have available to us. Yeah, this is one to look out for. If you haven't picked up a bottle of Smoke Point 2 yet, you probably should. Um, it's quite excellent and very different uh, for people who are um, trying to support local distilleries right now. And it's, you know, obviously um, a good time to do that because small businesses across the world are struggling right now due to the COVID-19 outbreak. If you are um, specifically trying to put your money towards more local um more local companies. Um, this is a great one to add to your collection because it's unlike most other whiskies that you can get here in BC. There's not much similar to this. That being said, the next whiskey I've yet to properly try, but it's probably going to be PD. I'm thinking. Um, so before we move on to that, I should tell you that if it is still available, you can get a bottle of this exact size. Uh, normally $50.35 down to $45.32 with the 10% off, which again, you can get for a week after this video uh, debuts, or if you're a premium member, anytime you like. And the full size bottle, which I don't have one to model here right now, but there's some downstairs in the store, is 86 even normally. So we're putting that down, 10% off again at 77.40. Lovely, 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 lovely. Yeah, very good. So, I say the next whiskey is probably going to be peaty uh, because the name is begins with the word peated. <laughs> um, so this is a uh, an interesting one. It's actually not technically a whiskey. They call it a Magna Bracha. I think I'm pronouncing that vaguely correct, but this is Macaloni's peated Magna Bracha. Um, winner, apparently, of the World Whiskey Awards 2020 World's Best New Make, which is very impressive, actually. Um, cool. That's, that's very, very cool. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the Victoria Caledonian uh, releases, this might be something you've already tried. It's been available in the distillery for a while now. We've only just started picking it up for the Strath. Uh, we look forward to having a much stronger um, relationship and we're, we're committed to bringing more uh, Victoria Caledonia products into the Strath and look forward to that relationship blossoming. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a distillery that I, I've, I've always had a soft spot for, um, especially as, you know, Graham Macaloni um, is, is a... It's, it's a very uh, well-known figure here in the whiskey scene. He has always been a part of the, the Highland Games and the whiskey festivals. And ev everywhere that you think uh, that whiskey can be on the island, you've probably seen Graham there. He's, he's very involved. Um, and it's, it's also, uh, it's also um, kind of a, an emotional favorite for me because I actually got to spend uh, a week at Victoria Caledonia 
um, I was one of the, the test market for their whiskey school as well. Um, so I got to spend time with their distillers and with Graham himself and with their tour guides learning all about the distillery um, at that time. That was, ooh, that was a while ago now. That was like two and a half years ago. Um, I'm sure it's evolved and in many ways since then, but uh, yeah. We had the original, I think batch two, the original release of Macnabrata that was available outside of the distillery, I think, uh, in the Drown Association a long time ago. And we put it to a... Uh, a blind tasting. Uh, we didn't let anyone know what it was, and we let people guess what it was, um, and we let people score it blind as well, which gave it a magnificently large score. Excuse me. I can't remember what it was. It was 90... Oh, God. I can't remember. I want to say 92, 93, um, something, something along those lines. Really, really good, solid score. Um, and people were guessing really old ages for it, despite the fact that I think that release was only like 18 months. Um, some people, one person guessed it was a, a single grain whiskey in its late 30s. Um, other people were guessing, I think the, the most common guess was a Highlands whiskey in the mid to late teens, which says a lot. Um, it says an awful lot. So I'm going to read the uh, excerpt on Victoria Caledonia from the Definitive Guide to Canadian Distilleries by Dan de Kergamo and Blair Phillips, available at every good bookstore. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Alrighty, Victoria Cardonia is on page 68. I really should have got glasses. Alrighty. Victoria Caledonian distillery certainly has what the Scottish distillers call the kit. Against an emerald wall, sparkling copper pot stills and fourth size of rockers stand century on either side of an equally sparkling brass spirit safe. A few barrels, feng shui perfected position, complete the photo ready backdrop. And yes, it is beautiful. Um, and it's it's a weird thing because it's in an industrial estate by the side of a highway in Sarnach. It's doesn't it definitely doesn't have the majestic landscape backdrop that uh, Shelter Point has going for it. But if you go to Scotland, not every distillery in Scotland has that either. It's not an it's, it's not an essential part of making whiskey. What matters much more so is what happens inside the building. And this is an absolute beautiful setup that they've got with um, you know state of the art, uh, like I said, four size copper pot stills, same kind of stills they do use up at Shelter Point. Um, and if you are in uh, Victoria, if you're visiting Victoria, or if you're uh, if, if you live here, do yourself a favor and go for the tour at Victoria Caledonia as well, um, where you can not only try their fantastic single malts, but also their very, very, very good beer. Okay, Scottish born and raised founder and president Graham Mataloni is trying to replicate Scotch whiskey in a Canadian locale and is making all the right moves. He began by hiring the late Jim Swan, a renowned Scottish distilling consultant, to advise him. Together, they developed a rapid aging regimen that they claim reduces the time needed to make and mature whiskey. While the whiskey matures, their in-house brewery generates income. Mataloni also hired Scotch whiskey heavyweight distiller Mike Nicholson to get the distillery running. And Mike, uh, again, someone who uh, people in the Victoria whiskey scene probably uh, probably know quite well. He's always at the festival. He's a member of the Companion of the Quakes and I think the BSMC as well. Um, a well-known figure here. Uh, Mike has decades of experience, um, mostly across the Diageo distillery. I think actually entirely across the Diageo distilleries, but he's worked at places like Kalila. Um, yeah, you know, he's he knows what's up. Um, yeah, uh, Nicole Mc... Uh, oh yes, before turning it over to an experienced brewer, Nicole McLean. I'm not sure if Nicole's still there, um, but yeah, Nicole, a fantastic brewer, worked in uh, Brewdog, I think, in Scotland before coming to Victoria Caledonia. Um, so... If, if Nicole has moved on, I have a feeling she might have. Um, she probably made this whiskey, because I'm pretty sure she was there, you know, between a year and a half to two years ago. So she probably made this, sorry, whiskey spirit. Um, in 2018, Macaloni installed a smoker so that the distillery could make its own peated malt, just as Pemberton Distillery um, had done four years earlier, and Distillery Field Roy back in 2016. So, peated. Uh, they're not they're not bringing in peated malt from Scotland like a lot of uh, a lot of distilleries do. Um, this is like a, a, two brewers up in Yukon. Yes, you get peated whiskey from them, but it's all actually peated malt bought from Scotland and imported. Um, I believe the same in could be said for Lowell McKinnon. I'm not entirely certain on that. Uh, it's difficult to tell whether this picture perfect distillery is in regular production yet because visitors are not permitted inside the warehouse. 
Selling investment opportunities is a key element of Victoria Caledonian's business model, and McAlooney's ultimate intention, as stated in one of many fundraising campaigns, is to either list in a public stock exchange or be acquired by a global spirits firm. And I have to speak on that before I move on, um, because that is something which you hear quite a lot, and sometimes in a, weirdly in a, a very negative tone about Victoria Caledonia. There's nothing actually wrong with that. I mean, I, I, I know, you know, craft whiskey and support local and everything, it, it's all very, very important, and I, I love supporting the little guys, but if you have a world-class product and you want to get it out in front of the entire world, You've got to think big. You've got to dream big. And that's exactly what Graham's been doing this entire time. And you look at distilleries like uh, Westland, who were bought out um, by, who was it, Remy Quattro, I think, owns Westland now. They've got bigger and better since then. And they haven't, they haven't declined in quality. The people who actually make the whiskey and who are actually in control of the, the company remain there for the most part. And some of the best distilleries in the world are owned by huge companies. Diageo, Mike Nicholson, we just talked about Diageo. Kalila, one of my all-time favorites, owned by one of the biggest uh, beverage companies on the planet. Um, things like Laphroaig as well, and, and just down the road in Isla. Uh, Laphroaig, owned by Beam Suntory, a massive Japanese-based uh, company. Just because you are... Um, dreaming big about where your money comes from doesn't mean that your um, your dreams of making good high quality whiskey are any less important like I think Graham recognized from the get-go that if you're going to make a fantastic product a, a product that is fantastic enough that people around the world are going to want to get it you need to already start planning and already have the intentions to make a business model that is going to be able to support the creation of that much whiskey to be able to support its uh, support. It. You know, you've got to wear trousers as big as your legs, you know, basically is what I'm trying to say. Or, or a kilt. Um, anyway, where did, I, where did I get to? So far, his project has raised about $10 million and his annual sales are about $1 million, primarily from the in-house brewery. Uh, for some of its whiskies, Victoria Caledonia blends spirits imported from Scotland, and that is something it does. I can't remember quite how they're um, calling it now, but they, they have a name um, difference between what they make completely in house and what they uh, what they release as blended malts, which I don't think are available in BC anymore. Um, but yeah, I've actually really enjoyed several of their blended malts. So by the first time I went to the distillery, I came home with a bottle of both their Among the Heather and their uh, uh, Dougal Stram, just Dougal Stram. I thought they were very good blends. Um, there was nothing wrong with them. Um, to be brutally honest, they were much more expensive than most people wanted to spend on a blended malt. Um, and it's simply because of the, <laughs> how they were brought in, how they were, um, you know, the, the tax structure, the, the quantity. They had to be that price. And I completely understand why it was that price. And I think it's very unfortunate that that was um, hampered their success a little bit. And I they have been successful still um, and I think the fact that people were willing to spend um, the amount of money that uh, was the asking price for them um, spoke to their quality and yeah we had power to Victoria Caledonia they they did well with those but I'm really excited that the tide has turned now and they are mostly almost completely focused on their own juice and yeah this I'm really looking forward to trying Magna Bracca, or Son of Malt, is the Scottish Gaelic saying for single malt. Um, which is something I'd never really heard before coming here, despite living in Scotland and having many Gaelic-speaking friends. But it translates correct. Whether it's actually in usage in Scotland, um, I, I, I wouldn't personally know, but I trust Graham as, a, as an actual Scottish person, unlike me. I'm from a small part of Scotland called Yorkshire. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, this is uh, this is going to be cool. I tried some of the prototype stuff uh, that was snuck to me in a sample at Highland Games a while back, uh, but I have yet to try the finished product of the Peated Magna Bracca. Um, what makes Magna Bracca special to uh, some of their other releases is it's that original Jim Swan creation that they use of the shaved, toasted, and recharred casks, the STR. I think Portuguese wine casks, I can't quite remember, maybe Spanish, some kind of I think Iberian, <laughs> some, some kind of Iberian wine cask um, that Jim Swan um, helped um, them to get um, a, a good supply of. 
and taught them how to use in, in a very effective way for the for the climate and for the type of whiskey that was being distilled by them. This is uh, this going to be this going to be exciting. Uh, let's actually read the little neck tag here. They've gone they've gone to the trouble of putting a neck tag on. We should probably do them justice of reading it. The new make underpinning this single malt took world's best at the prestigious 2020 World Whiskey Awards. This is the first single malt outside of Isla to use Canadian barley peated peat smoked to 54 parts per million at the distillery in a proprietary soaker smoker. Whiskey maker Dr. Graham McElhoney studied the tradition, traditional peat smoking process in Isla, re recreating it here on Vancouver Island. The nose is medium peat smoke, wood ash, floral notes, fruit, heather, lemongrass, juicy malt, nutmeg and cinnamon, a palette of creamy, very smooth, pleasantly warming, big peat with waves of peat smoke, heather brush fire, wood ash and tropical fruits, finishes with floral nectar, a dry malt sweetness, coconut milk, a hint of salt and lingering smoke. And whilst I did enjoy the prototype that I did try all those uh, months ago now, my one takeaway from it was not very peaty. And I don't know whether that was just a specific batch that I had or whether it just hadn't call come together or whether I just maybe had an odd leg 10 before it and everything else tasted like a morangey after that. No idea. Um, but let's find out where this one's at. Cue the montage of me trying to open a bottle awkwardly again. There we go. Lovely. And the glass over here. Look at the colour on that. And yes, your casks really do make a beautiful spirit. Ooh, my! That made my nose itch. Whoa. Let's see if you be on this bad boy. 46? 46? Doing it right. Does it mention anything about chill filtration or colouring? Handcrafted, distilled, matured, and bottled by. Product Scotland. I don't see anything on here. Ah yes, non-chill filtered and natural colour, right on the front. That's probably where I should have been looking in the first place. They should be proud of that. They wouldn't hide it on the back label. That's very exciting. Mm. So right off the bat, this smells... I know I was just mentioning it because uh, uh, because they had a head distiller that used to work there, but it smells very Kalina-esque to me. Maybe slightly more Kilcommon. It's got that burning tyre smell in a good way. As the peated whiskey is the king of the asterisk, the asterisk put in a good way. Mm. Yeah, that is lovely. Actually, it's very peaty, um, much peatier than the prototype I, uh, I I tried. And honestly, this is entirely my own fault that it's taken us so long to get uh, this particular whiskey into the strap. Um, I was a little put off by that prototype, to be honest, and it that's on me. I should have actually done the legwork and managed to get myself um, to the distillery because it's only down the road or a sample of it uh, at least so I could uh, do the finished product more justice than my maybe slightly drunken memory at a ham and games. <laughs> That's, I'm learning. I'm learning all the time in this role. But boy am I glad we've got it now. That smells delightful. Yeah, hay. Burning hay. It's very barnyardy. That's very Scottish. My. Mmm. Wow. Based on nose alone, if you were to put this glass in front of me and tell me it was a nine-year-old Isla. Absolutely. Absolutely. My god. I thought that first Magna Bracca was possibly a bit of a fluke, and in in, essence, in in terms of being, you know, sometimes a little brutal honesty um, goes a long way in this business, um, and it's something I have said in the past that I will, I will happily say is now in in the past officially, I thought the best Magna Bracca release, the the first Magna Bracca release I had was the best, and it kind of went a bit downhill um, after that, um, which was slightly upsetting to see, and whether that was just I don't know. My, my mood at the time or what I was tasting it with or maybe I didn't just maybe I just didn't do it the justice it deserved in terms of the reverence and you know treating it um, with more I don't know respect as a whiskey and not just 
trying a sample at a festival, which is, frankly, I love festivals, but one of the worst ways to actually judge on whiskey. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't very, I, I wasn't very happy with the with the the, the releases um, after after that one that we had, uh, and I never actually brought it back again. Um, which I feel really bad about now. I, I really, I really should have been supporting these guys a little bit more. Um, but I'm really, really happy to say that the quality of their more recent releases is astounding, and that is something I realised um, actually at uh, at one of the festivals. Uh, a little while ago, and uh, actually something that um, uh, to, to to say thank you to another um, prominent part of the whiskey scene here, um, the uh, one of the founders of the Victoria Whiskey Festival, uh, Lawrence Graham, actually came to me and said, "Have you tried Have you tried Graham stuff recently? Like, it's really good. Like, you should you should give it a try." So after that, I did hunt it down a little bit and and uh, give it more of a go and yeah i'm i'm really happy now to say that i fully endorse these whiskies i do um i i'm uh, yeah i'm really really happy for them that uh, they've they've got to this place in their in their journey um i'm not talking about this place as in they've they've made me like them uh, no i mean they've got to this place in terms of they have full whiskey releases now um they have um, special editions. It's still, you know, very small boutique releases right now, but they're really building ahead of steam and starting to grow as a company, uh, grow both in size and experience. And it's really wonderful to see how far they've come in a few short years, um, both as whiskey makers and as ambassadors for whiskey here in British Columbia. Uh, they've been spearheading a, uh, a new collaboration with other distilleries. Um, I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to talk about that, but um, keep an eye on it in the future. Um, yeah, they're they're doing fantastic things for whiskey in general here in BC. So, Slashivar and, and cheers to uh, everyone involved in Victoria, Caledonia, and that includes all of the hundreds and hundreds of investors, both here in Victoria and around the world. Hmm. That is wonderful. I can, yeah, I can definitely see why they're Peated New Make won, won awards. It's a Peated New Make, much like Kilcommon, uh, that is designed to be able to stand up uh, as a spirit in its own right. It's not a New Make that is um, like many distilleries New Makes, where it's not actually very good, but they know what they're doing. They know it's going to be really, really good after 12 years in the cask. This is a, this is a spirit which has a much shorter time frame in mind um and gotta be honest a lot of that is cash flow and that's completely understandable for any small company for any new company um, like these guys cash flow is a very important part of the business and if you're going to be you know aiming high and thinking in 20 years time you're going to be a world-class distillery with a um, a 10 year old whiskey that's on shelves in every country across the world you've got to start somewhere and you've got to build that um, and it's a it's a tricky it's a tricky wire to walk on because you can't just build that from the get go with a whiskey that is kind of rubbish but shows potential. You've got to you've got to actually make a product that gets people talking. And it's really good that they've managed to do that so early on. Um, yeah, and I have to say I really do enjoy that beer as well. Um, it's uh they've got some pretty good releases the uh keeping glass is uh a beautiful pilsner <sighs> yeah so if you're a peat fiend and you want to support local you can absolutely do it uh if you like a lightly a light amount of peat shell points out one if you like big heavy isla style peat magna bracca peated magna bracca um, both Vancouver Island, both icons of Canadian whiskey, which I, I wholeheartedly believe are going to be staples in the whiskey scene. Um, these guys aren't just flashbangs. They're, they're in it for the long run. They're going to be around for a long time. And if you want to get in on the ground level, now is a perfect time to do it. Start picking up some of their early releases. Buy one to drink and one to save. And, uh, yeah. Go on that journey with them. It's going to be a fantastic journey. So yeah, thanks to Shelter Point. Thanks to uh, Victoria Caledonia for 
are supporting local whiskey. And of course, thank you to Divine. This is a fantastic, incredible trilogy of whiskey distilleries to have um, a stone's throw away from you. We are in so, so lucky here on Vancouver Island, and there's so many more on Vancouver Island that deserve a shout out more, more than I can really remember or mention. But, you know, Phillips are doing a great job with their first release. Uh, there's wonderful things coming out of Nanaimo. Um, yeah, there's, there's so many things happening. And of course, our brothers and sisters on the mainland who are represented here today by the Art Society Com Com uh, yeah, Commodore. I don't know what I was trying to say there, but it wasn't Commodore at first. Comet door, I don't know. Um, we are incredibly lucky here in BC to have a wonderful whiskey distilling um, movement, which I truly believe one day will turn into a whiskey distilling legacy. Uh, thank you for joining me on Drinking Out Loud. I have no idea what the next video is because I don't really know when this is actually going to air. Um, but cheers, and I will see you next time. Here's the whiskey kisses, the peachy taste of sin.